Yeah. Yeah. Another way. Anyhow, uh, I had a little further discussion with one or two extremely sapient young women in this course who pointed out to me that my arrangements were not entirely satisfactory and that if I... How does this sound? How does that sound? Too loud. How does that sound? Englishmen are always supercilious, so I might as well go around with my nose in the air. Anyhow, the, the fact is that uh, the thing is being recorded. This seems to me to be a comfortable quantity of students, and I take it that what has happened is that the, you, you, you took a, a private boat sometime over the last two days and deputed all the extra students to go and deal with the Krugerrand. Uh, or that it's just simply the weekend has happened, or finally you found your way to chemistry three, or some of you found your way to chemistry three. I find it much happier to have rather fewer people. But it was pointed out to me by some students simply that if you can go and see the lectures at 11.30 uh, on Monday, Wednesday and Friday, you get into a lockstep. You either have to be here or there. So it is possible for you uh, also, to go and see and hear me if you don't fancy being so crowded, if you miss the bus, or have those famous, more important things which you need to do, uh, you can go probably at 8.30. Who would find 8.30 in the morning, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, a convenient time if they didn't? How about 8.45? How about eight? Hmm? I used to be very addicted to a TV show called Get Smart. And uh, my, lecturing technique, my lecturing technique is largely based upon that immortal person. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, I've got some idea. Please either sit down or go and hear me uh, on Monday, dear. Because I just cannot stand having people standing up. Hmm? You can go and you can go to you can go and you can go some other time and hear my words of wisdom percolated through uh, the splendid processes of technology. Uh, we've got enough people. Could we have this door shut, please? 
um, because now I want to start, and we still have an enormous distance to go, but I'm starting off because I have reordered some of the books, and some of you will find that helpful. When I got to the Baytree bookstore, I discovered that not nearly enough of you had bought a book which I hadn't so far recommended, but which is the most beautiful book which I've recommended. And I only recommend it because it doesn't need requirement. It's far too beautiful. It's extraordinarily beautifully reproduced, and it is a book of the utmost beauty and fame, and it was written, illustrated, printed, and published by William Blake, and it was hand-colored by Mrs. Blake very often, which tells you something about the subordinate status of women artists at the end of the 18th century. Though, to do Billy Blake justice, Mrs. Blake and he used to sit with nothing on in the garden in terms of perfect equality and amity, and I don't think William Blake was a particularly violent chauvinist compared with most people. Anyhow, he was the most marvellous artist, and you all know one of his greatest poems. It is called The Tiger. You, you do know it? Hands up the... What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer? What the chain? In what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grass dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Could we have the uh, screen down? Uh, uh, yes, we'll have the screen down. I'll explain this in a moment, because we can have the screen back up. And the light's right off. The light's right off. Screen down, the light's right off. Because I want to show you <laughs> what the book is really like. And uh, it is extremely interesting. Uh, and I can well say a teeny bit more about William Blake. I've written up his dates on the board, so that you can see he was an Englishman who was living just at the time of the Industrial Revolution. And the fact is that he earned his living as a craftsman. And it is that craft that in some ways I want to explore today as I finish off uh, reciting to you your various assignments. And we're very nearly through the assignments. I do it slowly, but I hope rather painlessly. And what I'm now showing you is one of the poems from this extraordinary book. It's actually two books. First of all, he wrote the Songs of Innocence, and then he wrote the Songs of Experience. And he was, at that stage, it was about 1792, 1793, so that he was in his 30s. He never made much money because he was perhaps the most experimental printmaker who has ever lived. Uh, and he had absolutely no head for commerce, and he'd been brought up in a rather old-fashioned way. He actually had the sort of education that you could get if you were going to become a great success. The sort of education that you get at Berkeley, of course, rather than UCSC. But he was much more like a UCSC student than a Berkeley student. He wasn't laid back, but he certainly was pretty eccentric. Uh, and I think you can rejoice in that. And here is one of the songs of experience. Oh, Rose, thou art sick. The invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. And there you see the worm, and you see, in fact, how Blake marries something. He marries words, 
and images in a way which was absolutely unique at the time in Europe, which, of course, will be very familiar to all of those of you who know anything about Far Eastern art, and which became, of course, prophetic, just as Blake himself wrote prophetic books. So his interest in what, in fact, of course, was an entirely medieval thing, the marrying of words and images, has, of course, become astonishingly important in the 20th century, uh, where artist after artist does precisely this thing. Now, Blake, let's have an X, please. Blake was a craftsman, and he probably suffered from the industrializing of the arts as well as the industrializing of everything else, because a tremendous revolution took place in printmaking during his period, and he certainly was deeply conscious of the Industrial Revolution itself. Here he has his little poem to the chimney sweep, a little black thing among the snow, crying, weep, weep, in notes of woe. Where are thy father and mother, say? They are both gone up to the church to pray. Because I was happy upon the heath and smiled among the winter's snow, they clothed me in clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes of woe. And because I am happy and dance and sing, they think they have done me no injury, and are gone to praise uh, his, his priest and king, who makes up a heaven of our nursery. Well, Blake was an absolutely unorthodox thinker, and he coined, of course, the phrase, the dark satanic mills. And he himself, sadly enough, you see, invented printing methods which were incredibly costly and laborious to produce. They weren't mass production. And the songs of innocence and uh, experience exist in no more than 23 copies. But lucky us, we have planometric methods of the 20th century, which are so remarkable in terms of reproductive printing, that we can buy for less than $10 this absolutely beautiful and prismatic and exquisite books, which contains many of the most beautiful poems in the English language, and certainly the most beautiful pages in any books. And so I would thoroughly recommend you to go and buy uh, a copy of this uh, from the Bay Tree Bookstore. If you buy nothing else, and if you do nothing else in this course, if you look at those poems and read uh, poetry surrounded by such exquisite radiance, you'll have learned something which will last you the rest of your life. And what you have to do, of course, is to improve your mental furniture. And much of your mental furniture is at the McDonald's level at this stage. <laughs> hmm? And you have to get it up at least to the Gump's level. All right. What I then want to talk about this morning, and I do find this somehow, I feel sort of halfway between Sam Hall, hmm? damn your eyes, you remember the poem of Sam Hall, and they strung me up, damn your eyes, and they hanged me, damn your eyes. And I hate you all, one and all, damn your eyes. That famous 19th century musical song, I feel a mixture between that and a pop star. And uh, neither suits me. Uh, however, I'll, I'll bear with it for the moment. Is it all right? I find it sort of strangely, sort of murmurous and echoing. It means I can't really make a big effort. Never mind. I want to talk about your assignments, and I want to talk about innovation. And in particular, at this stage, I want to suggest to you that one of your, one of your uh, alternatives within the realm of your art project is to experiment in some form of printmaking or other. Because printmaking is perhaps the single most important art, if we look at it in its full regalia, which develops in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. I only have to mention to you the names that I put up on the blackboard. For instance, the lithograph. You see, the lithograph is the poor man's painting. And the lithograph develops at the end of the 18th century, at the time when people are becoming more interested in color printing. And notice that Blake actually prints the text not in black on white, but in a lovely rusty bister color. And then he gets Mrs. Blake, and he probably sat down with her and said, Catherine, my dear, let's do a little bit of tinting together. Mm? And then he said, well, I'm off. Uh, you can finish it off. 
well, you know, you know what men are. Uh, maybe, maybe he didn't. Maybe he said, Catherine, you go down to the pub, hmm? and I'll finish it. And don't forget to bring back those couple of pints real quick. Hmm? Well, we don't know, but the personal relations between William and Catherine Blake are very interesting. Those of you who want to read about Blake, let me recommend a book which was written by a man recently, fairly recently dead, Jacob Bronowski, whom some of you may have come across from television, who was a very interesting person, and he wrote a wonderful book about Blake called A Man Without a Mask. Or there's a book, quite a good book, with lots of illustrations by a pseudo-poetess called Kathleen Rain. And there are many other books. There's a book by Riven Todd, T-O-D-D, Rain, R-A-I-N-E. But Blake is a most interesting person. Anyhow, you can see that Blake and his wife, while they make these incredibly expensive books, nonetheless are doing them in color. And one of the great efforts of technology is, you see, to make colored images available to a very large populace. And you start off, of course, when you start off printmaking altogether in the 15th century. Some of the early prints were, of course, hand-colored. In the 16th century, you have a very, very brief moment when you have what are called chiaroscuro woodcuts. And the chiaroscuro woodcuts are two-colored woodcuts, or three-colored, three-block woodcuts. But then color printing tends to languish until the end of the 18th century. And towards the end of the 18th century, you have a, a veritable and extraordinary explosion in printmaking techniques. And in order to explore those for a moment, could I have the screen up for one minute and the lights on, because I just want to rehearse for you uh, the kinds of printmaking there are, because I think you should all know this. And it's a very simple thing, and I don't think it appears in the textbooks, and I think it is absolutely crucial. And basically there are three ways of making a print. They are called the relief process, which is very simple, the planometric or contact process, there's the planometric, here's the relief, and then, if we can get it right up, the oldest in many ways, not the oldest, but one of the oldest, up you go, and, interestingly, you learn something from its name, the intaglio process. And there you are. I hope you can all read it so that you'll all be able to spell it. Intaglio. Now, I think once we've got those and you've written down for yourselves those useful dates, uh, and I will do that, and I'll also pronounce the people for you, William Blake, Theodore Gerico, Honoré Daumier, Francesco Goya y Lucentes. And why is he Lucentes? Because, of course, his mother is immortalized in his name as well as his father, which is one of the nice things about uh, the Spanish. J.M.W. Turner, Toulouse-Lautrec, Charest, Max Ernst, Henri Matisse. These are names we should come across. Because I'm now going to rub them out because I just want to show you... Can you hear me? All right. Yes, that's the one advantage of this beastly little gadget is I can turn my back on you and you can still hear. Is that right? Yes, good. Oh. So, now, it'll take about ten minutes, this, but it's worth it. You are all, of course, actually familiar with the relief process. Because, is there anybody in this room who has never made a potato cut? What do you make? Um, a rutabagus cut? Or a swede cut? Hmm? You know, and in the relief, what you do is, here's your surface, let's say it's a wood block, here's your surface, and you cut away some pieces, here we are cutting away some pieces, down they go, very neat little slots, mm -hmm. and then what do you do next? You take your roller and you roll along the surface, zump, 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 okay? And then the ink, because of the roller, can't get down in there unless it's terribly narrow. So then what happens when you print? You bang something down on this, or you bang this down on something, and the ink prints. Hmm? And that is the relief process. It's very, very simple. Contrast it with the intaglio process. Here we are, we have the same cake, and we make the same niches into it. Okay, there we are, identical niches. More or less identical niches. Got to do them faster so they won't be quite identical niches. 
Now, this time, what do you do? You do not get a roller and roll along the surface. You get a dabber, and you put your ink on the dabber like this, you know, sort of something like this. And then, and here we are, here is the, here is the, uh, the plate, and you go poop, 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 and then you take a bit more ink, and you go poop, 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 and it takes, look at the distance, look at the difference it takes in time, dears. With the other one, you go rup, 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 and it's done. With this one, you go tup, 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 tup. Now, with the relief process, you go rup, rup, and then it's ready to print. But with the intaglio process, you go boop, 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 and it's still not ready to print. Let us see it in diagram four. So what is happening? You're getting ink here, and then you're getting ink down in there, and then you're getting ink there, and ink down in here, and ink there, and ink down in there, and then... Now, what would happen if you tried to print it now? You'd get a very, very solid piece of work, wouldn't you? <laughs> it would just be a very solid piece of work. So, in the intaglio process, you have to do one more thing, which is you have to get rid of all the superfluous ink here. So you get a cloth, and having done dip, 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 go swish, 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 which in diagrammatic terms is simply that. Swish, okay. <laughs> and then, then you might start printing it. But before you do that, you know, the cloth is only sort of, it's not really, I mean, you know, the cloth is not really all that satisfactory. So when you finish with the cloth, you then do something which is called palming. And you go, la 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 And you go, la 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 And you go, la 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 And it's said to be extremely sensual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's why printmakers, you know, have such sensual palms. Mm? You look at the palms of a printmaker. Of course, you get yourself quite dirty, but you're able to get off the last little bit of what normally used to be a copper plate. All right, so let's take the first one again. Relief. And you print the relief just by banging this down on the paper or banging the paper down on this. All right, now you've got this beautifully inked. And you've done your palming. Not perfectly yet. We've got to get that palming absolutely right. Ah, there we are. Beautifully palmed. How do you print this little fellow? Well, you have to do it with pressure. You have to press the paper down into these declivities to scoop up the delicious goo. <laughs> so, while this is just a sort of bang, 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 and can go at tremendous speed, the other one, you have to roll your etching press mm, very slowly and push, and the paper has to be very damp, much damper than for a relief process. So what do you learn? You learn one very simple thing. You learn that a relief process is a quick process and an intaglio process because of the way in which you ink and because of the way in which you print is a slow process. All right, what about that curious, I'll write again in Taglio here, what about that curious third process, which is planometric? And here we have, we have our lovely little cake here. There he is again. Mm. Plano. Okay, Plano. Okay. So, what happens when, when, you don't make a, when you don't make a declivity into the thing and you don't, in fact, create raised portions? Because these are raised portions, these are declivities. Do you just throw the thing away and hope for the best? No, planometric means that there's some other way of distinguishing between sheep and... Uh, uh, sheep and... Uh, goats, yes. Sheep and goats. Hmm? Obviously, we don't have many sheep here or many goats. But, uh, and the way... The, the, the best known way, the one that we're really concerned with, is lithography. And what actually does lithography mean? You are familiar with it if you really think a moment. You all know something about graphic, hmm? graphology, hmm? monograph. It has to do with the word writing, doesn't it? Graphic means, in fact, writing. It means brilliant writing. So, what does litho mean? No, 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 photo is light. Litho is stone. Stone. 
a, a monolith is a single stone, isn't it? So what you, what you then realize is that lithography has something to do with stones and writing. And what it really is, that there's a peculiar stone in Bavaria, and that stone has the most exquisite and extraordinary grain. It's really like a kind of calcified Monterey Jack cheese. Hmm? Just, just that little bit porous, you see, and very, very even. Now, stones aren't all as even as that, but this is a wonderful stone. And in the 1790s, Alois Senfelder, in the 1790s, Alois Senfelder actually discovered this wonderful property, that this stone was porous, and he tried to draw on it for some reason. He was wanting to make an advertisement. And it tells you that lithography is the method which, of course, becomes the great advertismental method. Hmm? Lithography becomes a method of the poster, dears. You can see how important it is. And he discovers a very interesting thing. He writes with grease, and the stone is damp. And he simply discovers, here is Senfelder, and he writes a bit here, and the grease penetrates the stone. And he writes a bit here, and the grease penetrates the stone. The stone is damp. He then runs his roller with the appropriate ink over it, and what happens? That ink is greasy, isn't it? The ink is greasy. He uses a greasy ink. Now, you know what will not mix? Chalk and cheese. And what's the other thing that won't mix? Oil and water. So what happens is, here the stone is all damp. And here the stone is all damp. And here the stone is all damp. So that the greasy ink will not adhere to the stone there. It comes to a piece which has been so nicely protected by the greasy chalk, and the greasy ink says, ha ha, home at last, let's get married. Hmm? <laughs> and so it comes down plonk there, it refuses to come down here, it comes down plonk there, so that what you eventually have is a nice little piece of greasy ink here and here, and then you see, is it, how, do, how does it, is this simple to print or not? Well, nothing is simple, of course, not in art, but it's much, it's a damn sight quicker to print than this is. Much quicker than the intaglio, and really, in essence, because you're using the roller, it's not all that different from the uh, relief. So that lithography begins to be a quick and splendid process. There are a couple of other things that I would like to say about lithography immediately, and that is you see, if you're taking relief, you have to cut. Now, re the relief process, because you need to have all these things raised, tends to be used for wood or things softer like lino or potato. And it takes quite a long time to cut. And the moment you start cutting, you know simply that the, sh the line is not going to be as free as suppose you want to do like that. All right, let's have a look at the intaglio process just for one more moment. Are you still interested? We mustn't waste time. Uh, anyhow, so basically, with your relief process, you use a, a burin, um, an engraving tool, to, to do the cutting. Actually, for a, for a wood cut or a potato cut, you can use just an ordinary knife. For the intaglio, there are basically two, two or three different methods, and I think it's worthwhile going through them. One is the method of etching, and I just... For those of you, I know a lot of you know etching, but you've just got to be patient for those. Hand, hands up, those of you who've made an etching. Well, not bad. However, it's just for the others. We'll just rehearse it. And the etching makes use of the fact that your metal doesn't like acid. And so here you have your plate. And the first thing you do is you coat it all round, all six sides, with an acid-resisting material, a kind of wax, usually. And then what happens? You take an etching needle and scratch in the wax. Now, notice the, the extremely important thing about this, that you scratch so that you can do something which is really rather free. And that is why Rembrandt's etchings are so beautifully free and calligraphic. What happens then? So you make a little scratch. OK, there we are. You've broken into this. And then you dip it in the bath, the acid bath, and gradually it eats. And it eats a larger, larger. Oh, and of course, if you leave it too long, it eats right through the damn plate. Hmm? And then you have to start all over again. 
And then you put your ink in and you, you print it in the normal Taglio fashion. But it gives you much greater freedom. The, the engraving is a much stiffer and slower process. And in the 18th and 19th century, you would find an engraver possibly taking as much as a year over a single engraving, dears, or even more. The aquatint, and here we, here we have the aquatint. The aquatint is very much late 18th century. The mezzotint is, starts in the 17th, gets more important in the 18th. The aquatint is only a variation upon the etching. The mezzotint is a very much more complicated thing, which I don't think we have. Do you want to hear about the mezzo or not? Yeah. Right, we'll hear very quickly about the mezzo. You, get, you understand the, 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 uh, the idea of the aquatint. No, the uh, idea of the etching. I'll just do very quickly the aquatint, because if we're going to do it, we might as well do it. Okay, the aquatint. Here you have your plate. And this time, what you do is you make a powder. And it's a sort of made out of some kind of resin, very, very fine, and you drop that, hmm, like snow, onto your plate, okay? And what happens eventually on your plate is you've got a thin, thin layer of this powder. You then proceed, when you're making aquatint, to heat the plate to make this gummy powder adhere to the plate. And by the way, ac when you're making aquatint, it's hopeless to have a cold, because you sneeze all the powder off the plate if you're not careful, you see. So, you, you make it out here by heating the plate. Then, you simply, of course, coat the other five sides with acid resisting, and then you could, put it in the, you could put it in the acid bath. If you put it in the acid bath immediately, what you'd get was an increasingly granulated surface, wouldn't you? Where the acid ate round the little granules of sand, of uh, resin, do you see? So, that your plate would, here we are now looking down on the plate now, and it would, it would be covered with little dots where it would be pitted. It would be pitted. It would be like an old man's chin in reverse. Actually, it would be more like an old man's nose. You know, those horrible little pity things. Mm? <laughs> Anyhow, it would be pitted. And then when you printed it, you know, you'd push. You'd do it in the normal Italian way. And you push all the ink down into the pits. And then you wipe off the surface. You get a lovely grey. The point is that an aquatint and a mezzotint are tonal methods, not linear methods. Now, how do you get an image with an aquatint? What you do is you use a stopping out liquid, a liquid and you paint on the surface, and where you've painted, the acid can't get. So where you've painted, it will be white, because the acid not being able to get there, the, the surface of the plate remains smooth. Notice that you paint it. So it's again extremely liquid, exactly the opposite from the engraving, which is stiff. So you see that aquatint is tonal. We might even write that up. Tonal. Aquatint is immensely tonal. As a matter of fact, mezzotint is also immensely tonal. And now we'll just quickly do the mezzo. We haven't, I haven't been going any time at all. I'm doing this immensely fast. Hmm? Now the mezzo... Again, notice the mezzo is an Italian name. It's actually invented in the 17th century. But what you do with the mezzo is you have your plate. Here's your diario plate again. And we've seen that in order, in an intaglio, to get an image, you have to roughen. You have to, you have to do something to the plate in order to push the ink down into it. So with a mezzo tint, what you do is you get a rocker, a roulette. And what happens with the rocker or roulette is you roll it all over and you roughen the surface of the plate until it's rather similar to an aquatint plate. You see, the whole surface is roughened and then you can push your ink in. How do you get an image as distinct from just getting the ink into the plate? You roughen the plate first. So here we are, it's all roughened. Mm, yum, 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 It's all rough, roughened. What you then do is you get what is called a burnisher and... You burnish a little bit, you rub the roughening away, and you make it smooth, and then you ink. Now, what happens when you ink? The ink will not adhere to the smooth surfaces. So that mezzotint and aquatint have something in common. Mezzotint and aquatint are both media in which you work from light. You, the, the first thing you have to establish is not dark, but light. You work from a dark surface to a light surface. It'll all be dark, so you have highlights. 
Now, mezzotint is, again, a, re a reproductive. It's a, very, it's a very good reproductive medium. Actually, many mezzotints look very like photographs because, and this is really perhaps the most crucial thing, if you look at the lineup of the dates, Aquatint, late 18th century, mezzotint coming into its prime in the late 18th century, Senfelder with his lithography in the 1790s, and then, fascinating, copper engraving is succeeded by steel engraving. Now, the difference between copper engraving and steel engraving is very, very simple. And it consists really of two things. First of all, with steel, you can get a much finer line. The second thing is, with steel, you can take many, many more prints. The steel engraving, like the wood engraving with Mr. Buick, Ah, uh, and here, rem let me remind you, Mr. Buick, and we've already seen a bit of Mr. Buick, the steel engraving is a tonal method. And in fact, J.M.W. Turner used it for doing the most, you know what a Turner looks like, it's called tinted steam, Turner's, Turner's technique, it's a technique of tinted steam. Wonderful pale gauzes, the most delicate, delicate transitions of tone, so that steel engraving becomes very, very tonal. So you have tonal t steel engraving. The other thing about steel is, of course, that it lasts long. So you can take plate after print, after print, after print, after print. How rapidly does an etching wear out? Hmm? 50 if, you're, if you don't get the pressure wrong. 15 if you get the pressure wrong. Uh, 200 and you've got to start re-engraving. You've got to start re-biting. A steel engraving you can run 50,000 off. A wood engraving you can run 500,000 off. Uh, technically speaking, there is no reason why you shouldn't be able to use lithography for enormous quantities, the planimetric method. Hmm? So that you can see that the steel engraving is for the mass market. Hmm? The uh, wood engraving is for the mass, mass, mass market. Lithography is for the mass market, but all these innovations of the late 18th century are also moving towards the tonal, moving away from the linear towards the tonal, are becoming more and more like paintings, and that is because more and more people want paintings, and because the demand for images, which are real and natural, hmm, and imitate nature, and, of course, are like Audubon's great birds, uh, grows and grows and grows. If you're interested in this whole subject, there is a wonderful book by William Ivins called Prints and Visual Communication, I-V-I-N-S. And some of you should be deeply interested in it because it's an extraordinarily important subject. Indeed, as I said to you, I think in some ways, let's have the screen down now and look at some things. It is perhaps the most important single uh, change which takes place in the whole history of art in our period, with its culmination in the most tonal, the most tonal of all these, of all these things, the photograph. Because a photograph is simply uh, a series of different tones, a series of different depths of tone uh, on a flat surface, isn't it? A photograph doesn't draw anything. Uh, so, and why is it so important? It is so important, my dears, because it alters the terms upon which the public relate to the artist. The moment you increase your printmaking, that moment you enormously increase your audience. And the crucial thing, of course, is the change in audience. At the beginning of our period, in, at the end of the 17th century, the audience for most great painters was really quite small. Exhibitions were fairly few and far apart. It, Etching and, and copper engraving, these intaglio processes, were expensive. Books were comparatively expensive. Uh, you began to get open-air exhibitions. You began to get public exhibitions uh, in the 17th century. But the change takes place in the 18th century, when, of course, a much larger public comes into existence. And then after this public comes into existence, you begin to flood the market with cheaper and cheaper printing, cheaper and cheaper periodicals, until you end up, you see, with something like Dickens. And you remember that Dickens hmm, was, in fact, an illustrated, an illustrated uh, writer. Many people wouldn't have, Dickens would never have got going if he hadn't been illustrated to start off with. And so, one of the, one of, another of your alternatives 
uh, in order to fulfill uh, my desire for you to do some artwork, and I do desire you all to do some artwork, however incompetent you are. Mm? And some of you will be as incompetent as any five-year-old, which of course is fine because uh, child art has been in for nearly a century, uh, and some of you will be extremely competent, but one of your alternatives is in fact to make a little book of poems and illustrate them. And if you want to do that, I will allow you to combine the first, uh, combine your first paper with your art project. If you will make a book of poems which you then proceed to illustrate. Because, in fact, of course, it's one of the oldest forms uh, of all art, and it is a form which, of course, was very interesting to Picasso, very interesting to Braque, very interesting to uh, a lot of uh, 20th century artists, and starting particularly interestingly with Blake. What I'm showing you now is just simply that mass market. And here's that mass market in turmoil, painted by George Gross, but you see, when you get in the 20th century, you get uh, great beehives, you get uh, arcology, you get vast cities, and you have the evening paper and the morning paper. Now, just imagine if your evening paper didn't have peanuts in it. Well, I can do without peanuts myself. I find all those doomsbrys and boomsbrys rather dull. But one of the things that happens is, you see, with the development of these new graphic methods, you have a means of communication to a large populace. And that produces one other thing which is of enormous importance in the whole history of art, the rise of the caricature, the rise of the cartoon. And let me point out to you that the cartoon, in particular, the, uh, the story told in a series of pictures, what is the story told in a series of pictures the ancestor of? If we've been talking about the mezzo tint and the aqua tint as the ancestor of the photograph, what is the series of, of drawings uh, the ancestor of? The film, exactly. So the comic strip, and there is a book on the comic strip by a man called David Kunzel. It's not a very good book, it's rather heavy, mm, a bit overloaded. But uh, the comic strip dates back actually to the 15th century. It begins to gather power in the 17th century, becomes enormously important in the 18th century, and then you see gradually becomes the film. So that you can see the extreme significance of the mass market being communicated with all times of day and all times of night. And there, it's in political turmoil and needing political cartoons. Let's have a look at the next one. And here, you see that mass market in America, Pip and Flip, the twins, the extraordinary twins, this is by Reggie Marsh. And there they are all crowding. And what are these? These are posters, and they almost, almost certainly may have been done by a lithographic process, you see. And so you have to realize that we are surrounded by that graphic world. We're surrounded by posters. We're surrounded by the results of this technological revolution. Okay, let's have a look at the next. And uh, we now look, and there we are. That is what every beach will look like everywhere in about 20 years from now. Hmm? And that's what all English beaches look like, just about. Particularly this little element. Mm? Such a charming fellow here. Mm? Uh, and this is, again, that fascinating artist I showed you who did the mask, James Ensor, E-N-S-O-R. And some of you were asking about him. He lived from 1860 to 1949. Quite extraordinary person. And at Ostend. And here is a beach at Ostend. Fairly usefully crowded. Mm, a little bit like the beach down by the pier at Santa Cruz. Okay, and this is an etching. But my point is that when you've got all those many people, of course they have to have cheap novels, and they have to have picture postcards to send from the seaside, and so they have to have an absolute plethora of visual images. And so we get the development of all... Let's have a look at the next, the development of all these prints. I wanted you to see now one more Buick, and this one I'm showing you... He, he wrote a famous book called British Birds, and what this does is to show you the scale, because the book is scarcely larger than this book, so you get an idea of how actually small the wood engraving is, and therefore how subtle its tonal development can be. And if you're not satisfied with that, let's have a look at the next. And now you begin to see, because this is a familiar image, isn't it? It's familiar to you because Vincent van Gogh Mm, was so deeply moved by this image of the prisoners that he made a painting of it. This is from Gustave Doré's very famous large book uh, on London, and it is wood engraving 
Now, wood engraving had to be done because they needed very hard wood on boxwood. And boxwood uh, only grows into very small pieces. So what they eventually did was to stick lots of small bits of boxwood together to get these rather large plates. And that is in a book which is about 12. It's a folio, about 12 by 14 inches, you see. And you can see that in the hands of the reproductive wood engraver by the 1860s, you have an extraordinary control of tone, don't you? And you see it is incredibly like in certain respects. Uh, a photograph. And what, of course, happened in the late, later part of the 19th century was they would, they, would, they would develop a photograph on a wood block and then they would cut that wood block, you see, so that you could use the photograph in a reproductive way and have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of copies of it. So you could, if you wanted to do an art project, you could do an engraving a wood engraving, or you could do some potato cuts. Here is Blake again. Now, Blake's processes are quite unbelievably complex, and this was almost like a monotype. There are only about five versions uh, in existence of uh, the great Nebuchadnezzar, and it's extremely rich in color because there must have been multiple printing. Here you see the face, a quite extraordinary and wonderful thing, isn't it? Mm, quite, quite mad, and here is just the back feet. And you can see the graphic element, the carved element, but the process is an exceptionally complicated one. And so, in one sense, it's not terribly important. Very different is the process, of course, which Goya used, which was a mixture of etching and aquatint. And here you can see a little of the tone of aquatint just here. And here you can see the etch lines done with an astonishing freedom. And this is his self-portrait for the Capriccios, which, let me point out to you, oh, help. Oh, this is all right. It's just me that's falling to pieces. Hmm? Uh, buttons coming off all over the place in my enthusiasm. Uh, the fact is that these, this was for the Capriccios, which is a series of satirical prints which Goya did about 1800. And he wanted people to laugh at them, but he also wanted people to be guided by them. Let's have a look at the next, which will show us a few more of these. And here is a detail, and now you can see the extraordinary granulation. You remember my telling you about the granulation in the aquatint. And you can see it's a pitted surface which goes extraordinarily well with these frightening spider's leg-like lines produced by the etching. And Goya achieves an astonishing degree of freedom and expressiveness. And that, of course, is one of the qualities of the graphic arts. They're ripe for expressionism, which is why the German expressionists loved the crudity of the woodcut, for instance. Here we are, here's the whole thing. And now you can see the aquatint. You see the tonal elements. This part was absolutely stopped out white. And then the next area is this. You put the, bar, you put the plate back in the bath, a bit a little bit more. And then you bit a little bit more and stopped out a little bit more till you get these deep darks here. And mm, she is pulling teeth. Uh, from this hanged person. She's not enjoying it very much. And here's another detail shows you, again, the extraordinary qualities which Goya achieved with his etching, uh, and there's the whole thing. Quite small they are, and these have been, of course, they were suppressed uh, during Goya's lifetime, but they've re been reprinted many times since, always getting more and more blurred. Okay, so there's Goya. And Goya, as well as exploring aquatint etching, uh, also explored lithography, but not as much as did Theodor Jericho, who became fascinated by lithography when he came to London, because London was one of the great technological centers of the Industrial Revolution, and this is a London scene, and as you can see, it is extremely like a drawing, isn't it? You might almost think that this was a drawing. You could see the pencil marks here, but it was, of course, drawn on a lithographic stone and then reproduced, and it's called Pity the Sorrows of a Poor Old Man, and the, the lithograph Here's another Jericho of boxers, again, another English scene, done about 1820. And then here is Daumier, and you all recognize the splendid scene, don't you? What is this? It is the fall of Icarus. And there is Icarus like a plucked chicken, hmm, with all his feathers, and there's silly old Daedalus looking at him through his telescope, hmm, and this is done as a lithograph. Now, the lithograph has some very special has one very special thing about it, which made it ripe, you see, for political cartooning. It was very quick to do. You drew on the stone, and then immediately you could start printing from it. If you use an engraving or an etching, it's going to take a great deal longer. And Daumier produced these kind of lithographs at the rate of at least two a week for about 40 years. You work out how much that is, and you work out just how hard he worked. So you do... Uh, you could do a lithograph. Uh, 
And then, of course, it became not a weapon of reproduction or of political maneuver. It became, in the late 19th century, in the early 20th century, a fine art object, the lithograph. The, 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 the interesting thing about the lithograph, it's so sort of poised between commerciality and fine art. It's so poised between just being useful for propaganda and being delightful to artists. And here you recognize a fairly early Matisse using, once again, a lithographic chalk, hmm, because you can either draw on the stone or you can paint in something which is called touche on the stone. But here you're drawing and you get this lovely grainy quality, which sort of slightly grates on your teeth. But there it is. Uh, but lithography in particular lent itself to color because of the large areas of flat color which you could get. And so you begin to see, first of all, with Chéret, and then with this fascinating person called Toulouse-Lautrec, you begin to see lithography applied to, you know, the most obvious form of art museum, the real museum with that wall, the museum of the hoarding. And, of course, your visual education takes place largely on television, largely in the newspapers, and, of course, on the walls of public buildings and that wonderful art which was so extraordinary in Santa Cruz this Easter. I don't know, did any of you go and look at Leask's efforts for, for Easter? They're the funniest things, and weird little rabbits trotting to and fro, hmm? and inflatable rabbits and deflatable rabbits, uh, the art of window dressing, most important art. Anyhow, let's have a look at the next. And uh, this is another Toulouse-Lautrec. Notice that the lithograph in poster on a large scale can give you these wonderful, rich, simple surfaces, which are very similar to the Japanese woodblock. And so it's not by accident that we have the divan japonais. So if you wanted to for your art project, you could do a lithograph or a poster. And I last thought I'd show you, you know, the full development of the color lithograph with somebody like Chagall. And you can see he's using the stone in a wonderful way. Let's have a look at another Chagall. And you can get the most marvelous color with lithography. Another alternative, which of course is something quite different, but I think is one that uh, many of you will want to do for your art project. And that is what I think is sometimes called découpage. But what it really is, is cutting paper up or tearing paper. And the effect is very close to a silk screen print. And anybody can do it. Matisse, in his extreme old age, when he was rather bedridden, could do it and did it absolutely marvelously. And all you need is some different colored pieces of paper and a pair of scissors and towering genius. Mm -hmm. Well, you provide the scissors and the paper, and Matisse will provide the towering genius. Mm, they're done right towards the end of his life. He did them on an enormous scale, some of them, sitting up in bed. But many of you could have an immense amount of fun because, of course, the cut edge is often so sharp and so firm, and if you want a decorative effect, and then one you begin to discover is the relationship of color. You know how this blue affects the pink, and how the pink affects the blue, and how colors bleed over into each other. Okay, let's have a look at another, because I think many of you, I'm not very keen on your doing the other kind of collage. You may do a collage for your art project, but I'd much prefer you to do it in the fashion of Matisse, or the fashion of Max Ernst, than in the fashion of UCSC, because the ordinary UCSC collages are pretty dull. Hmm? Here is another really superb Matisse colored paper thing. It's absolutely wonderful. And you see what happens when you do it on a really huge scale. It can be infinitely decorative and marvelous. Collage was invented about 1912, but this particular kind of thing, look at the white on the different color and then the black, the counter change, such beautiful and rich things made so simply, made with such simplicity. You know, it's wonderfully energetic and rhythmic. The other 20th century um, development, which I think is very fascinating along these graphic lines, is the development made by Max Ernst. And Max Ernst invented something which he called frottage. So you have collage, you have découpage, and then you have frottage. And what does frottage mean? It means rubbing. And you can see in this one, how does this wonderful eye get so bloodshot? These are the veins of leaves. And what Max Ernst has done is to rub... You've all done it, haven't you? Can you remember as a small child with a coin in your pocket? You know, and uh, social studies is getting very, very boring. 
Mm? So what you do is you get out your coin, you put a piece of paper over it, and then you rub your pencil over the piece of paper, and hey presto, there's Abraham Lincoln. Mm? Come through. Well, that is frottage. And in fact, Max Anson made the most marvellous images with frottage. He made the eye of God mm? out of frottage. Let's have a look at the next. Mm? He made all sorts of Istra naturel. Here's a bird made out of frottage. Frottage, the rubbing, after all, of old worn floorboards. Now, you may say, well, this is awfully unimportant. What a trivial, what a trivial, trivial thing you're talking about. It is actually extremely important because one of the things that emerges from that issue of Max Ernst is the fact, of course, that 20th century artists are not only very experimental, but they're also very, very deeply interested in texture. And Max Ernst here is absolutely fascinated by the quality of texture. He begins to make you extremely self-conscious about splinters uh, and every possible kind of weaving and so on. Let's have a look at the next. Hmm? Here's another one, another frottage. So you could do a frottage. Let's have a look at the next. But Max Ernst also did a very special version of a collage. And it's very dear to my heart. What he did was to buy 19th century wood engravings and cut them up to create these perfectly extraordinary new images. And here is this very villainous person uh, and he's about to do something but inadvertently while he's being thinking what he's going to do he's just put this bayonet through the poor girl's foot. Mm -hmm. And we don't know quite and in the meantime she has just been about to lay an egg in the bird's nest down here. Or is he going to lay it? Anyhow, you can see there's another one which I'm equally fond of. Let's have a look at the next, which is quite extraordinary. Hmm? And you see, you can have the most marvellous, marvellous, marvellous effects. So, there's that whole graphic world for you to explore in your, in your uh, art projects. Ah, uh, or there is the world of photography. And I'm showing you something which should take your breath away now, because I think this is the first real photograph that was ever made. And if you think it's somewhat blurred and a little strange, that is scarcely surprising because my recollection is that this first photograph was actually exposed for 10 hours. And during the course of that 10 hours, the sun moved round these buildings quite a bit. And I think the date of it is about 1827. Hmm? Is it 1827? 26, 1826. And the person who did it was a man called Nicephore Nieps. And Nieps died before his collaborator, Daguerre, uh, could really reduce the technique to something sensible. Now, I'll briefly remind you that a photograph really needs two things. It needs the ability to project an image in the natural world onto a flat piece of paper. That had been done hundreds of years earlier. Cameras are much older than photographs. The second element that was necessary was some means of fixing this image once you had projected it. And the problem of fixing the image was a chemical problem. And so you can see that it is in the early 19th century when there are extraordinary developments in the field of chemistry, particularly in coal tar, coal, tar, coal products, but in the, every field of chemistry. I mean, after all, what is it? Dalton starts identifying elements right about the beginning of the century. You can see that it's going to change when you begin to control chemistry much better. And the, the crucial mo moves occur in France in 1839 and in England in 1840 with two people called Daguerre and Fox Talbot. And those of you who are interested in the history of photography, I don't think you can do any better than read a rather old book by Beaumont Newhall, which is called The History of Photography. It's a fine mixture of technical history, aesthetic history, social history. It's a very balanced affair and is full of good reproductions. Anyhow, photography is, of course, as I said, the culmination of much of this graphic research. It's the culmination of a couple of other things. And I want you to think about it. It's a culmination of an interest in being able to reproduce the phenomena of the visible world very precisely on pieces of paper. It therefore speaks to that absolute passion which develops 
from the 17th century and rises up to its zenith in the 19th century, that passion, passionate interest in the natural world. I do not think we would have had photography quite so soon if there had not been, for instance, a passionate interest in geology, a passionate interest in ornithology, a passionate interest in ichthyology, a passionate interest in flora and fauna developing. And therefore, more and more books devoted to uh, the illustration of these things and a larger and larger demand, uh, the demand for scientific discovery, a demand for scientific exploration, a demand for visual images which were precise and accurate and told you what Madagascar looked like or what a Navajo Indian looked like or what Peking looked like or what uh, the uh, Taj Mahal looked like or what uh, the pyramids looked like and amongst the very earliest photographs are pho photographs of the Sphinx and the pyramids and then this even earlier photograph. Of course, the other thing that lends itself to this, creates the discovery of the photograph, is something very fascinating. And this is true particularly of Daguerre. Daguerre produces a form of photography which is known as the daguerreotype. And Daguerre was somebody who long before he actually made his daguerreotype using Nieps, was in fact a painter and the creator of uh, dioramas. Because by the beginning of the 19th century, you have, you're beginning to have a form of magic lantern, the predecessor of the slide projector. You're beginning to have a form of moving scenery, which will show you uh, Nelson defeating the French at the Battle of the Nile. Uh, you're beginning to have uh, rooms in which you go around, you get inside, and you'd see the whole of uh, Berlin painted or diorama around the room, and then you'd have effects of moonlight and so on. You were beginning to get, long before the end of the 19th century, predecessors of the cinema. And Daguerre moved from being a painter to being interested in these diorama, panorama kind of things, and then into uh, actually inventing the daguerreotype. This tells you one other thing which is beautifully connected up with it, which is simply, of course, that... One of the crazy things is that between the 17th century and the 20th century, more and more and more and more and more and more and more people get interested in art, in visual arts, and there isn't enough money to go around. So that if you're not a very good painter, you invent the photograph. So that's Daguerre. Fox Talbot is the English country gentleman, the amateur scientist. And these things are known as calotypes, uh, which has to do with the Greek word kalos, beauty. Hmm? Do you see? And so, about 1840, you have the development of the photograph, and its technological development proceeds really quite a pace. Now, you may, if you wish, for your art project, produce a series, not one, but a series of good photographs. Hmm? which is very, very difficult to do indeed. It is so easy just to click your way out of oblivion and into oblivion. But of all the things, of course, the photograph for the visual arts creates the most extraordinary changes. But it isn't, of course, only just for the visual arts. It creates terrible changes because we can freeze history. We could freeze history before we could really successfully freeze beef. Hmm? And freezing history, like freezing beef, is a very dangerous activity. Uh, and I want you all to think philosophically about the problem which the photograph creates in the visual world. Not just in the world of art, but in the visual world. Because it tells you in a way that somehow you have to believe that this is what the world is like. It gives a kind of authenticity to a particular vision of the world that objective vision of the world, that vision of the world which is supposedly non-human. Of course, it's not true. All photographs have a tremendous human element in them. But it seems to produce that objectivity which we are so foolishly running after. And that has the most profound repercussions for all painters, sculptors, and architects, and indeed for everybody. And I think now is the time when we're really having to battle with that in the deepest way, because we are moving into fundamentally an epoch now, and it's very interesting. If we were to take the 19th century, 
The fact is that photography does influence painting in some ways, but so many of the early photographers were painters, and much of the aesthetic of early photography was a pictorial aesthetic which had been developed quite naturally enough out of painting. Now we are in the opposite thing, and we find that the aesthetic of the late 20th century is a photographic aesthetic, and woe betide, dear painters, woe betide if you don't take some notice of it. My own view is to take the sort of notice of saying, ya boo, mm? but that's not very fashionable and not very wise. But I myself, while deeply interested in photography, find few photographs what you might call really beautiful. I find few photographs really exciting. Few photographs, you know, have much power. What was that phrase you told me last time? Few photographs are really happening. They're going on all the time, but they're just not happening. Hmm? <laughs> so, what is the time? 34. What? 12.35. People seem to have to leave a little bit earlier, or I'm getting more and more boring on Friday. Hmm? Anyhow, so we'll, we'll be thinking about photography again. Let me just finish off these damn projects for you, because I've got to do it fast. Well, you may think that there all that printmaking and photography is so important technologically, but equally important, and again, I would be very keen for you to do some, would be to experiment in watercolour. And here is a watercolour by a man called Gertin. And let's have a look at the next, which is a watercolour by Turner. And these two Englishmen raised watercolour from being a very, very minor world to being a very, very major thing, and totally altered again the way we look at the world through the medium of watercolour, because what does watercolour do? Watercolour enormously lightens the palette, because watercolour is translucent. Watercolour allows you to do much more readily. First of all, watercolour allows you to go out of doors much more easily, because it's much lighter. Watercolour allows you to do something with the sky, because watercolour you can move much faster than oil paint. Watercolour alters Turner's vision in a very deep way. Now, I said Gertin and Turner, and that leads me into something else. Gertin and Turner were the first sort of modern grupo. They got together uh, at Dr. Munro's house, and you could have said that they hatched the art movement called cloudism, or steamism, or mistism. The first modern art movement, notice the quality of modern art movements, it's always when some young people get together and say, we're fed up with the establishment. We're fed up with all those rotters, Sidney, Janice and co. in New York. We're fed up with the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco. Modern, they say? Christ, it's as old as the hills. Mm? Uh, and they say, we're going to do something different. Mm? And uh, so they hatch mysticism with watercolour, or they hatch the Nazarene movement, and then they hatch pre-Raphaelitism, and then they hatch Impressionism, and then they hatch Divisionism, and Pointillism, and Post-Impressionism, and Quasonism, and Cubism, and Fauvism, and Surrealism, and Minimalism, and Dismalism, and Fismalism, <laughs> and so, wait a moment, now, I want to start talking about your first, your first written piece, which is meant to be light-hearted. And one of the things that I thought you might do is to invent a new art movement. And I'm going to show you one or two possibilities mm, in due course. You give a history of a new art movement. Well, here is, in fact, pre-Raphaelitism. And pre-Raphaelitism was, it was John Everett Millet, it was Dante Gabriel Rossetti, it was Holman Hunt. It was fascinating, partly because it has, again, a new technological aspect. These young people were in revolt against Sir Joshua Reynolds, but they were also using some new pigments. They were using the new coal tar pigments. And if you notice certain very brilliant colours in the next few slides, you see the coal tar pigments. Look at the purple here. Let's have a look at the next, another John Millet. Look at the blues and look at the brilliant, virulent green. That awful sort of green that makes you feel slightly seasick. Mm, that slightly nauseating bang green. Mm, and the bang blue. Let's have a look at the next, because this is Arthur Hughes. And Arthur Hughes, aha, now have you ever seen a mauve quite this colour before? I mean, it, it really zings like absolute mad. And it is one of the new coal tar products. So that pre raphaelitism goes back in history and forward. And again, Henry Wallace again noticed the brilliance and hardness 
of some of the pigments. It's a great change from the palette. And of course, actually, if you think of Impressionism, here's another, this is um, Henry Wallace. Look at that blue. It's passionate color. If you think of the Impressionists, they, what did they, here's Holman Hunt uh, by the Dead Sea. Look at that yellow. Mm, it's a new kind of yellow, which, so that you can have the pre-Raphaelites and the Paraphaelitism, and then this new technology of uh, new color. If we think of the Impressionists, let's have a look at the next. Here's another Holman Hunt, particularly brilliant, particularly the carpet. Again, of course, the, ca the carpet was dyed with these new colors and then painted with the new colors. If we have a, well, there's a, a, t um, a constable cloud, uh, cloudism. All right. Cubism, there we are. That's a very famous movement. All right, let's have a look at another. Mm -hmm. Impressionism. Now, of course, Impressionism, very fascinating. What was the technology which was particularly interesting for Impressionism? It was the fact that you could now buy your tubes of paint. You could buy your tubes of paint from the store. Mm, and your paint came in tubes. You know, I mean, think of the difference when you actually go out painting between having all sorts of powder. The moment, on a windy day, what would happen to the powder? Mm? Or you'd have these little, these rather nasty little um, uh, pouches, you know, little bags, little, 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 little sort of uh, leather uh, things in which you had them. Mm? The tube is an absolutely marvelous invention. So we might think that Impressionism really might have a rather different name. It perhaps ought to be called Tubism. Mm? Uh, let's have a look at the next. Mm -hmm. Then we have, of course, Divisionism or Pointillism, uh, the technique of Siora and Co. Let's have a look at the next. Or we have Fauvism, the, the movement of the wild beasts, here manifested by Vlaminck. So I want you possibly to write something. And you could write the history uh, of an art movement which was called Umbrellism. Mm. Uh, and one of course the chief, the chief ma masters of Umbrellism would be Renoir. Uh, but there are a lot of Japanese Umbrellists. Mm. Or uh, then I thought Soutine was really the head of a very special movement which was called Antrovism. Mm. <laughs> so you could have Antrovism as your art movement. Or here's another one. And this is a painting by B.R. Hayden, and it is of Quintus Curtius Rufus, a crevice mm, opened up in the Roman Forum quite suddenly. So I thought you could have mm, an art movement which was called crevicism, or even better, abysm, mm, <laughs> as he descends into the abysm. I think that's pretty abysmal, isn't it? Mm? Ah. All right. Or. You could have the cubism, as I told you. Or, and I suddenly thought, you know, actually, there was an artist who went in for tubism. Hmm? Uh. And this is Henry Moore doing the London Underground, which is always known in England as the tubes. So here you could do a, a, a history of an art. You can invent your own art, art movement, tubism, whatever it is. Hmm? So light-hearted. Oh, damn, that's on its side. But an alternative in your first funny, light-hearted paper, would be to assemble all the princes in hell, Lucifer, Beelzebub, Moloch. Now, you know, this is, in fact, it wouldn't be possible to get it right way up, would it? Hell, hell, you know, has got a bit old-fashioned. <laughs> it would be possible to get it right way up, but not yet. Mm. Hell has got a bit old-fashioned. The fact is, you know, it was decorated by Hieronymus Bosch at the beginning of the 16th century. And hell badly needs redecorating. So I want you to imagine and write a short story about the princes of hell getting together and inviting uh, an artist whom you decide. It could, of course, be, as one friend of mine said to me, it could be John Singer Sargent. Uh, it could be Bonnar. But I don't think Bonnar would be very good at redecorating hell. You might get awfully mixed up. Matisse wouldn't be exactly the right man for hell, would he? But Picasso might not be bad. Max Ernst has something. Hmm? De Koning could do a pretty good job. So get your, get your, get your devils together and redecorate hell. Uh, and write a short story about the redecoration of hell by uh, an artist in our period. Let's have a look at the next. And the next. 
Uh, no, oh, yes, I... Yes. These are two images by an American artist called Stuart Davis. And it is perfectly clear that artists have been deeply involved in the commercial world. And I thought that another alternative would be to have a discussion hmm, uh, at the board uh, of UCSC uh, um, amongst, the, amongst the senior administration as uh, to which artist they should employ to uh, give UCSC a new image which was more in tune with Silicon Valley. Hmm? So uh, that's another alternative for you for a light-hearted paper about a rather heavy-hearted subject. Uh, let's have a look at the next. Well, this is another form of conversation which you might like to write about. Picasso had a very large number of wives and a very large number of mistresses. And I thought you might like to write a conversation amongst the wives and mistresses of Picasso. Just let's have a look at... I mean, you know, he really had very different views of women from time to time. Hmm? And the next, a different view, different woman. Dora Ma, yes, and the next, a different view, a different woman. Hmm? And the next, this is all Picasso. I mean, he must have had very, very different ladies. And Picasso again. And here he is with yet another lady. Uh, and here he is with yet another kind of lady. Hmm? And all those, AE and, you know, a little quarrel amongst them, com uh, deciding who contributed more to the greatness and who contributed less to the failure of Picasso. Greatness and Failure of Picasso is the name of another book by John Berger, which I have ordered, and which, if you like ways of seeing, you will very much enjoy. So that's another kind of paper. There's a, another last Picasso image. Another alternative for you would be to recognize that art has been a great deal forged in the 20th century and I want you to write a short story about the forgery of an appropriate work of art within our period and its total effect upon the history of art. And I'll give you two instances. One was a very fascinating forger who in the late 1960s forged Samuel Palmer's. And he was very, very successful. And then he admitted it and has had a wonderful time ever since as a TV personality. Mm? And he, he's most fascinating. He's a complete and utter mimic. You know, he, you, you, you say, all right, mm? forge a Renoir for me. And he immediately starts looking like Renoir. And his hands begin to get absolutely arthritic. And he gets that wild, ancient Renoir look. And then he does an absolutely huge fat girl a la Renoir. So he is interesting, but of course the great forgery story of all time was the story about Vermeer. Vermeer is the last artist you should have had in the winter quarter, and he's the first artist you should have had this quarter, but, uh, well, whatever happened, happened. <laughs> Anyhow, Vermeer was forged on a colossal scale with the most tremendous success and the most burning and passionate shame by a man called Van Meegeren. And Van Meegeren did everything that was necessary in order to forge. The first thing he did was to discover exactly how people in the 20th century authenticate paintings. And in the 1930s, of course, science was a big thing. You didn't actually look at what the painting looked like. You submitted it to a spectroscope to chemically analyze it. And so he submitted his forgeries to a spectroscope. He did spectrum analysis, and he used exactly the right pigments to convince all these pundits that they were 17th century pigments. And then you didn't really look at the painting. You looked at the subject matter, and you looked at the biography. And then you didn't look at the painting, but you looked at where the painting had been. So Van Meegeren bought a couple of um, small uh, chateaus in France, which nobody had lived in for a long time, you know, with large attics. And then he cleared out the attics, you know, and then he made sure that these particular chateaus had been owned by Dutch people at some stage. So the painting was found in the attic of an old chateau which had been owned by Dutch people at the end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century. So it had a superb provenance. And this way he manages, then he chose to forge a very mysterious painter about whom there wasn't much biography. Because, of course, if you, if you know everything about the biography, it's rather more difficult to, 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 to do the forging. But Vermeer 
Van Meer had a mysterious first period in which he did religious paintings, hmm? like this one of Christ with Mary and Martha, and there are only two of these paintings. And then there's a gap, and nobody knows anything about Van Meer, and then he starts doing something else. And so Van Meegeren just painted this mysterious period in Vermeer's life, the five missing years, and he produced the five missing paintings. And we can look at those five missing paintings, and here is one of the five missing paintings, Christ at Emmaus. And this was bought in 1937 by the Boisman van Beuningen Museum for a world-shattering price of 50,000 guilders, which was, you know, the, one of the highest prices ever painted for, paid for a picture at that time. And they thought it was a wonderful Vermeer. You know, all the newspapers all over the world said, Boisman buys Vermeer, great triumph of Dutch museums. Unknown Vermeer comes to light. How was Van Meegeren caught, do you know? He was involved, inevitably, during the Second World War, in rather shady dealings with the Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering, because, of course, he was dealing in paintings all the time, and he probably sold Goering one or two forgeries. Mm -hmm. But after the war, he was thought of as a collaborationist. You know, he collaborated with the Germans, so he was brought to trial. And then the funniest thing that could ever happen, happened. He said, well, of course, I, was, I wasn't really collaborating with the Reeks Marshal. I was selling him forgeries. I was making a fool of him. And they said, no, absolutely not. Those aren't forgeries. They said, no, that's a real Vermeer. Hmm? It's like the Vermeer in the Boisman's Museum. And he said, yes, it is like the Vermeer in the Boisman's Museum. I painted it. They said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. That, I mean, that's a Vermeer. You're talking about Vermeers. You're a dirty, filthy traitor. You were selling the Reese Marshall Vermeers. No, I painted it. They wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe it. They had to give him paints in prison. And in prison, he painted yet one more Vermeer. <laughs> and finally, finally, he convinced them that he had forged those Vermeers. And I just, I want you to look at this pot. Hmm? And you see that that pot, Van Meegeren owned that pot, and you see, so did Vermeer. Hmm? So he got all the props, because here is the Vermeer, and let's see the whole Vermeer, and there it is, and the woman was asleep when Van Meegeren came in and stole it. Hmm? <laughs> so you can see that writing about a forgery could be an immensely entertaining activity. I suggest one final alternative for you, uh, for a light-hearted paper, and that is you could give some advice. And you could be, first of all, uh, an artist in Rome around 1800, writing home to give your younger brother or younger sister some good advice how to be a success in the art world. And then the scene changes and you're an artist in Paris. Hmm? And you're writing home to your mistress hmm? or your loved one and saying, you know, how to be a success. And then, in the 1980s, you're a young man or young woman in New York, and you're writing home to your mother, hmm, telling her how to be a success as an artist. So, have a lovely weekend.